Today is the 9th of April, 2009. We are at the Buffalo Erie County Historical Society. My name is Wayne Clark and my assistant is Kathleen Matthews. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Okay. Yeah. Gerald Joseph Miller. I was born in Krogan, New York, uh, up in northern New York, uh, November 24th, 1923. Did you attend school there? No. Uh, Krogan is a small, very small town where my father lived and grew up, and uh, uh, before I was ready for kindergarten, they moved to Lowellville, which is 27 miles from Watertown. Most people know where Watertown is, mm -hmm. but they don't know where Lowville is. And Lowville is spelled Lowville. It was named after a general from the Revolution, I guess, whose name was Lau, and that's why it's pronounced Lowville. Okay. I uh, went through my whole uh, grade school education at Lowville Academy and uh, started there in kindergarten and graduated from high school there in 1941 about 110 people in my graduating class. And uh, I was an only child. Uh, my parents, uh, uh, we probably have had more children, but my mother had an ectopic pregnancy, and so after I was born, they weren't able to have any more children. Mm -hmm. uh, but my high school graduating class was a great bunch of uh, people, and. Uh, we had a group back in Lowell who kept track of the members of the class, so we had uh, annual reunions every five years. And uh, so I know a lot about the other class members, and uh, especially the men who were in the service and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, did you uh, go on to college when you graduated? I graduated from high school in 41 and started at Hartwick College down near Binghamton in it was in Oneonta, New York, Hartwick College. I started there in the fall of 1941. Uh, managed to get a small scholarship, which made it possible for me to go to college. And then, uh, of course, in December of 41, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, we all became very much aware of our immediate future. And uh, uh, I finished my freshman year and then went back to Hartwick in the fall of 1942 and uh, by then, uh, all of the men in the school knew they were going to end up in the service if they passed the physical. And so they started volunteering for the unit they wanted, to, or the kind of service they wanted to get into if they didn't want to go in the Army. Mm -hmm. And so my roommate and I volunteered for the Aviation Cadet Program. Uh, it was then the Army Air Corps, and uh, we had to go to Albany to take a, a physical and a written exam in order to qualify. And we both passed this exam in December of 42. They said, go back to Hartwick, we probably won't call you until next summer. But in February of 43, we got letters uh, saying report to Albany, and uh, that's when we went in the uh, Army Air Corps. Uh, one of the, th the facts to me that's real interesting is that uh, Hartwick was a small school, only 400 students and nobody had any money, but uh, there were three fraternities at Hartwick and they were all more like co-ops and, uh, and so if you came from out of town you joined one of the fraternities because room and board was only six bucks a week in, in the fraternity. Uh, in the fall of 42 there were about 24 men in the fraternity by the spring of 43, there were only four left. Everybody had gone in the service, except a few who couldn't pass the physical. And uh, also, there were some pre medal or pre dental and pre med students who uh, were temporarily exempted from going in the service, but then they had to go in. Uh, actually, the uh, the army put them through medical medical and dental school, and then they had to, you know, serve later. Mm -hmm. I came back to Hartwick in uh, the fall of 1946 and finished my bachelor's degree there in biology under the GI Bill, which was the greatest thing on earth. Uh, 
made it all possible for guys to go to college who didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my bachelor's degree from Hartwick and uh, then went to the University of Rochester. Uh, I was aiming for medical school, but uh, I settled uh, for a master's degree in biology from the University of Rochester and worked in a, uh, a rehab not a rehab, uh, research lab at the Atomic Energy Project. The University of Rochester had a, had a big research program and during World War II they did all the work on the toxicity of uh, uh, radioactive materials. But uh, we knew a lot about the radioactive uh, characteristics of these uh, elements, but we didn't know the toxicity, I mean, how much uh, how poisonous they were if you ingested them and so forth. So, mm -hmm. all during World War II, the University of Rochester worked on the toxicity of radioactive materials, and they continued it even after World War II. So I, I uh, got a job in 1940. That would have been 48 with the Atomic Energy Project there. Okay, uh, going back to your military experience, um, where did you go for your basic training? Went from Albany to Atlantic City, mm -hmm. and uh, that was amazing because I hadn't really been anywhere uh, outside of Lewis County and tough in New York until I went into the Air Corps, and uh, went to New York City, uh, went to New York Central Station, they transferred us over to Penn Station, and then we went to Atlantic City, and uh, amazingly at that point the uh, Air Force had taken over all the big hotels in Atlantic City. Uh, I suppose this kept the hotels from uh, going broke. And uh, had, I was there at, in February, and Atlantic City in February was miserable. We mm -hmm. walked up and down the boardwalk and froze and went out to a, a field outside of Atlantic City for physical education and so on, and marching and gunnery and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, from Atlantic City, I went to uh, a new program which was called College Training Detachment sort of thing. They sent us to Springfield College. I went there with about 500 uh, cadets, and that was a new program. We were only there, uh, the 500 people were divided up into five groups, and the first group was only there a month. Uh, and the second group was there two months, and then they kept bringing in new cadets to replace the ones that left. And uh, Springfield College was an interesting experience. Uh, uh, basically, that was a college for YM uh, people, people who wanted to go into the YMCA. And uh, all the students were gone, so the aviation cadets uh, were the only ones on the campus, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously that was a program that kept colleges from going broke. Um, from Atlantic, or from Springfield College, or at Springfield College, they gave us uh, 10 hours in the Piper Cub. We didn't get to solo in the Cub, we just flew in the back seat uh, at the local airport and the uh, instructors were civilians that were hired uh, by the Army Air Corps. Um, and I got airsick every time I went up. Uh, it, we got 10 hours, which was about eight flights, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I threw up in the, in the Cub every time I went up, uh, which made me wonder whether I was going to be able to get through the aviation cadet program because they didn't flunk anybody out at that point. You just got 10 hours in a cub. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from Springfield College, we went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where the aviation cadet program uh, tested everybody and made a decision as to whether you could go into pilot training or if you didn't qualify for pallet training, you could go into navigation or bombardier training. And almost everybody wanted to be a pilot, but uh, not everybody uh, passed the physical. Uh, a lot of the stuff that they gave you had to do with uh, manual dexterity and 
and coordination and so on and so forth. If you wanted to go into pilot training, you had to pass all these little tests that they had, funny little machines that tested the, how good you were athletically and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I got through the pilot uh, part of it. And, oh, interestingly enough, I, I wanted to say that uh, in order to get into the aviation cadet program, you had to be five feet four and weigh 115 pounds. And uh, I ate a big breakfast and I just made it. I was small at that point. I was still growing uh, uh -huh. uh, very much. When I came out of the service, I weighed 135. Uh, since then, I've added many more pounds. But uh, uh, Nashville was miserably hot. Uh, that's what I remember about uh, Nashville. And we got a lot of phys ed and so on and so forth. But then from, from Nashville, we went to uh, Maxwell Field, uh, where we got uh, pre-flight a lot of uh, uh, coursework in classrooms. No flying experience, but uh, and it, it, Maxwell Field was was set up a lot like the military academies with uh, uh, upperclassmen who uh, gave the the new men uh, intense uh, military discipline. I guess you would say mm -hmm. uh, a lot of. Uh, chewing out and, and walking tours and so on and so forth. Uh, Maxwell Field was outside of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, uh, I mention that because later I went, came back to Montgomery for basic flying school. But from uh, Montgomery, I went to uh, primary flying school in Arcadia, Florida, where we uh, flew, we got 75 hours in Stearman uh, primary trainers. Was that the biplane? Yes, great airplane, loved the Stearman. Uh, I almost brought a picture of it, you've probably seen the Stearman. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, Carlston, that was Carlston Field outside of Arcadia, Florida, and uh, that later became, or was, it was run then by Embry Riddle, which now has two four-year colleges in aviation, one in Miami and one out in Arizona, I think, and uh, they train all kinds of people for the field of aviation today. At that time, uh, Embry Riddle ran this pilot training program, they had two fields, uh, one on one side of Arcadia and the other one on the other side, and uh, everybody flew Stearman's, and uh, you got, uh, uh, Emory Riddle hired civilian pilots and paid them to, to teach the cadets how to fly, but at the end of the first 25 hours, you got a military check ride from uh, an Air Corps from an Army Air Corps pilot. Uh, they had a few that were stationed there just to give these check rides. And if you passed the 25 hour check ride, then you got 25 more hours, and then you had another check ride, and so forth. And uh, we, uh, of course, the weather was beautiful there. We flew almost every day. But as I say, I just loved the steering. It was a pleasure to fly. Soloed after seven hours, I think. And, and uh, of course, uh, Carlson Field was just a, a small field, so in order to uh, give everybody practice landing and so forth, they had a bunch of auxiliary fields scattered just a few miles from Carlson. And uh, what was interesting was the fact that uh, Florida was a great beef producing state at that point. So every day we'd go out to one of these fields and the first thing you did was buzz the field to get the cattle off it so you could use it for practicing landings. Mm -hmm. After Carlstrom primary, I went to uh, Gunner Field, uh, which was outside of Montgomery, Alabama, and, and flew the BT-13, uh, called the Vultee Vibrator. 
that was a single engine uh, plane with a, a, I think about a 450 horsepower engine. Uh, and it was a step up from the Stearman. Uh, and you could do almost anything in that plane. Uh, it, as a pilot in training, you know, we had to do uh, stalls and spins and turns and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and that was a good experience too. Uh, after our, there we had another about 75 hours and then from there we went to advanced flying school and at that point they had made a decision as to whether you were going to be a single engine fighter pilot or a multi-engine bomber pilot and, and I uh, managed to stick with a single engine so I went to Craigfield in Selma, Alabama and um, uh, that was advanced flying school. We flew the AT-6 Texan which was another great airplane. There's still a lot of those around. And uh, in April, let's see, it was a little more in the year, April 15th, 1944, I got my wings at, at uh, Craigfield in Selma, Alabama. And uh, they, they let us go home on leave for a week, and then we came back to Craig Field uh, and got checked out in the the P-40, which was uh, the same airplane that was used by Claire Chenault with the Flying Tigers, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. in, in China. Uh, the P-40s, we got our ten hours and were really war-weary airplanes. They had been around and so forth. And, uh, They overheated very easily, so they wouldn't let us taxi out. Uh, they would take the P-40 out to the end of the runway and then start it up, and uh, you got in it and took off before the thing overheated. Once you got in the air, it was fine, but uh, you really had to be careful with overheating. And I think that the two flights that impressed me the most uh, was when I first soloed in the Stearman, you know, the first solo flight, and then the first flight I made in the P-40, because at that point they didn't have dual uh, Control. Uh, uh, dual seats, you know, front and mm -hmm. back in the P-40. You, you read about it for a week, you were told how to fly it and so forth, and then you got in it and took off. And the difference between the P-40, which was a real fighter <laughs> plane, and the AT-6 a training plane was just unbelievable, you know. You could get to 10,000 feet and it seemed like no time at all. But the P-40 by then was an archaic uh, fighter. It wasn't, didn't have a supercharger and it wasn't any good over 17,000 feet, you know, so uh, they stopped using it in, in a lot of places, although the British still had P-40s right up to the end of the war. Um, am I giving you what you want? Sure. Okay. Um, we, uh, we were then assigned to uh, what was called a replacement training unit, which was another uh, field in Florida, Punta Gorda, and there we got about uh, 200 hours in P-40s. We, uh, I was in a flight of 10 that trained together every day, and uh, we flew the P-40s, and uh, although this was an archaic, an archaic fighter plane, as far as combat was concerned, the P-40 was really a, a very good airplane, a uh, good fighter plane, uh, as long as you didn't uh, try to take it over 17,000 feet. And, uh, uh, so we flew almost every day. We flew ground gunnery and aerial gunnery. Uh, with the ground gunnery, they set up targets, and uh, uh, you went out to this, this uh, target field, and uh, flew a pattern, square pattern around the thing and, and dove on the, on the uh, target on the ground and, and pulled up and went around and, and did it again. Uh, that was fun, it was uh, good training, except uh, when you got into combat you found out that you didn't have uh, this kind of neat little uh, setup to, to shoot ground country instead of flying at a 
under 200 miles an hour, you might be going 350 when you were strafing a target. You know, it's quite different. Uh, and then we flew aerial gunnery where uh, another plane towed a, uh, a, we called it a sleeve, it was actually like a, a wire mesh thing with, uh, that had been sprayed with some kind of um, textile and uh, like five pilots would go up to do aerial gunnery and each one had uh, uh, 50 caliber bullets with a different colored paint on them, one would be red one pilot would have red, one another would have green, another would have blue, so that uh, after you shot at this target, they could tell on the ground who hit it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'd go up and trail along behind the, the plane that was pulling the target, and one at a, one at a time, we would take our turn going down and, and shooting at, at the target. And uh, I love to tell this story because uh, most people don't believe it. Uh, but we would fly over the Gulf of Mexico, uh, bright, warm summer morning, and I'd fall asleep in the P-40s. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly enough, as soon as the nose dropped, you know, I'd fall asleep and the nose would drop, the sound of the engine would change and it would wake me right up. So it, was, it wasn't dangerous at all. <laughs> but it, uh, uh, and we got... Uh, about, uh, as I say, about 200 hours in the P-40, and this was, this was a new thing, because um, we didn't get checked out in the kind of plane we were going to fly in combat. We just got checked out in the P-40, and we didn't know where we were going to go and, and so forth. And uh, as I say, I trained with a, a, a group of about 10, but there were, I don't know how many pilots were in other squadrons on this field. and. Uh, in uh, December of 44, they let us go home on leave for a week, and then we came back and they sent us to uh, Boston uh, to board a ship to go to Europe. And that was the first time we had any idea where we were going to go. Some of the pilots went to the uh, Pacific. I had a friend who ended up flying P-40s in China. Uh, but I went to England uh, on a small troop ship, and uh, that was an interesting experience because this was a, a ship that had been built for the Caribbean tourist trade, and mm -hmm. it wasn't built across the Atlantic, so we had to go over in a convoy, and uh, we had a few scares, but nobody, uh, I don't think any ship was sunk in our convoy by then. This this was uh, December of 45, and, and uh, the Atlantic crossing was relatively safe. Um, I mention that because I came home later on the Queen Mary, and uh, anybody who went over on the Queen Mary uh, didn't go in a convoy because the Queen Mary went over so fast the uh, submarines couldn't catch it. Mm -hmm. So the Queen Mary was, and the Queen Elizabeth, they were never uh, really in danger by being sunk by subs. Anyway, we landed in uh, uh, southern England. Now I'm blocking on the name of the port. It's very well known. And uh, the ship, this little ship that we were on, uh, had a bunch of Air Force pilots, Air Corps pilots, but it also had a lot of infantry uh, types. And uh, I remember this in particular because uh, this little ship would go up and down, bang, bang, all the way across the Atlantic. And in the front of this ship were a lot of black infantry troops. And I'm sure they had a miserable time on this crossing because uh, we were located more in the middle of the ship and it wasn't quite as bad. But this, this thing just bounced across the Atlantic. When we got to England, they, they said, uh, stay on board, you're going to go to a to France tomorrow, and you'll get off there. So the next day, the ship went over to Le Havre in, in France, and uh, as soon as we got to Le Havre, they said, somebody made a mistake, you should have gotten off in England. <laughs> <laughs> so we slept on the floor of the railroad station in Le Havre, which was a, a real, it had been a disaster, because at that point, uh, there wasn't any combat there, but the place had just, you know, 
bombed and bombed and bombed. Um, we slept on the, on the floor of the railroad station. The next day they put us on a train and took us to Paris. And the train that they put us on had uh, a few real modern coaches and then the rest were the old 40 and 8 boxcar type things. And uh, being Air Force Air Corps officers, we had these, these fancy cars. But there wasn't any heat on the train, so it was a, <laughs> a freezing experience getting to Paris. And in Paris, um, they put us up uh, in a hotel one night, and then they took us the next day to a, uh, a replacement uh, center on the uh, grounds of the Rothschild Chateau on the outskirts of Paris. And we slept in tents uh, for a few days until they were ready to fly us back to England. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was great because it gave us a couple of days in Paris and I got to see France and Paris. And otherwise I wouldn't have. I didn't get there any other time. Um, I remember that though in particular because uh, this very close friend of mine and I uh, decided we would go to into town and one of the places we went was to Notre Dame and uh, they had had some snow in Paris which was quite unusual. There was snow on the ground and as we went across this broad uh, uh, area outside of Notre Dame, this, this uh, friend that I was with, uh, who was really just a big kid himself at that point, uh, made a snowball and threw it at these French kids that were playing out in front there. So then we ended up having to run for the cathedral because they pursued us with snowballs. <laughs> uh, I mention that because he was later killed. He didn't get back home. So as I say, within a couple of days then they flew us over to England and uh, the war, of course, had moved out of Paris and that area and so forth, so you didn't really know there was a war going on, but mm -hmm. five minutes after we landed uh, in England, we heard a V-2 go explode, you know. The, the Germans at that point were uh, sending V-2 bombs to, uh, to London. I guess I should explain that the V-2 was a, uh, a missile type thing that went up to 75,000 feet, you know, it left Germany, went up to 75,000 feet and then landed in London. And uh, the British were really uh, much more fearful of the V-2s than they had been of the German, German bombing from airplanes because uh, the V-2 thing was completely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't know where these things were going to land. Uh, I went from Paris, I had been assigned to the 353rd Fighter Group, which was about 50 miles north of London, and uh, uh, about 10 of us went into the 353rd uh, Fighter Group, and others went to other fighter groups. And my friend that I, I mentioned who I went to Notre Dame with, he ended up in the 55th Fighter Group. Uh, in the 353rd, there were five of us who ended up in the one of the three squadrons in the group. We ended up in the 351st Fighter Squadron. And uh, then we were checked out and within a few days in P-51 uh, Mustang fighters uh, because that's what the 8th Air Force was using to escort the bombers to Germany. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the 8th Air Force started out with uh, B-17 four-engine bombers and uh, they called it the Flying Fortress and the theory was that with 10 machine guns on the B-17 that they would be able to defend themselves against the German fighters. They found out within a few weeks that that wasn't so. The German fighters learned how to uh, shoot down the B-17s and then later the B-24s, which was another four-inch bomber. And uh, so they it really had to suspend the daylight bombing until they got the P-51, because 
the P-47 fighter that the started in the 8th Air Force with uh, was a, had a an air-cooled engine that was a tremendous gas guzzler, and this airplane had a limited range. It could take the bombers to the edge of Germany, but then had to go back to England uh, so they wouldn't run out of fuel. And uh, that meant that the bombers were completely on their own from the edge of Germany to the target where they dropped their bombs, and then on the return trip from the, the bomb dropping to the edge of Germany, they had no protection against the fighters. Uh, the P-47s met them again uh, at the edge of Germany and, and brought them through France and back to England, but uh, uh, it wasn't until they got the P-51 that uh, uh, the bomber losses dropped to a level that could be maintained. and. Uh, the P-51 could take the bombers all the way to the targets. Now, did you have uh, an auxiliary tank on that aircraft? We had two, one under each wing, and that's what made the difference, too. Uh, we had, uh, the P-51 had a big fuselage tank. It also had uh, a tank in each wing, inside each wing, and then we had an external tank uh, outside each wing that could be dropped and the minute we got into any kind of combat uh, situation, that's the first thing you did was drop your external tanks. Uh, but, but there was a whole process here. When you took off in the P-51, you took off on a wing tank. As soon as you got airborne and could do it, you switched to the fuselage tank because uh, the fuselage tank was a big tank with 90 gallons of gas right behind the pilot, and it... Uh, uh, affected the center of gravity of the airplane, so you, you didn't want to get into a combat situation where you were uh, making sharp turns uh, with a full fuselage tank because uh, it would tighten up your turn. The, the center of gravity thing th threw the maneuverability of the aircraft off. Uh, so, so after you took off, you, you went on to your fuselage tank, and the P-51 uh, burned about 60 gallons of, of fuel an hour, and this was a night, the fuselage tank was an hour and a half, 90-gallon uh, tank, so by the time you got to Germany, uh, the fuselage tank was empty, and you then proceeded to use your external wing tanks uh, so that uh, if you had to drop them, uh, you had maximized your range by using those external tanks. The longest mission I flew in the P-51 was uh, six and a half hours and uh, went all the way to, uh, I'm blocking on the name of the town. Anyway, uh, <coughs> six and a half hours was enough to, to take the bombers to wherever they needed to go. And, uh, and then and coming back to England, uh, there were three different occasions when I was running low on fuel and I landed in Belgium uh, so that I could get back across the English Channel. Uh, now the, uh, I, I'm giving you stuff, I don't know whether this is... Oh, <laughs> oh yes, it's, okay. it's the, good. The, the Eighth Air Force started out uh, saying that everybody on a B-17 had to fly 25 missions. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the Memphis Bell, which was a famous B-17 in the 8th Air Force, completed 25 missions and they brought it back to the States and flew it all over for propaganda reasons, uh, fundraising and so forth. Uh, then the, as the losses uh, decreased, they increased the tour to 30 missions and by the end of the war, they were up to 35 missions and bombers for B-17s and B-24s. Uh, the tour in a fighter was calculated differently. It wasn't the number of missions, it was the number of, of combat hours that you had because fighters frequently flew shorter missions to uh, targets that were not as distant to me. Not all of our missions were escorting four-engine bombers. Uh, 
so uh, it, in the fighter it was 250 hours uh, for a tour and uh, I had uh, when the war ended I was only there for the last uh, uh, five months of the war from January through April of 45 uh, and I flew uh, 22 missions uh, 120 hours, so I had about a half a tour in the P-51 when the war ended, and uh, the VE Day was a great occasion in Europe, but we knew that if we only completed half a tour, uh, we were going to get sent to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So the whole group immediately after VE Day started preparing to go to the Pacific, and nobody knew at that point that we were going to drop the atomic bomb and in August and end the war. Uh, so once the uh, atomic bomb was dropped and the war ended, then instead of going to the Pacific, we they got us ready to come home. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I came home on the Queen Mary. Now let me let me just go back a minute. Uh, when you were escorting the bombers, uh, were you ever under attack, or did your aircraft suffer any damage? Oh yeah. Um, at the beginning of the air war in Europe, the Luftwaffe mm -hmm. had very experienced fighter pilots, many of whom had already had experience fighting the air war uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the Luftwaffe sent a whole bunch of uh, aircraft and pilots to Spain and they, they flew there. So they had combat experience before World War II started. So. And the Russians had done the same thing on the other side in the Spanish-American uh, War. Um, I went into the 351st Squadron with four other guys, or five of us went into the squadron in January. And when the war ended in April, uh, there were only two of us left. The other uh, three had gone down. One of my best friends was killed in a flying accident in England and the other two went down on combat missions. Uh, one of whom apparently became a POW, and uh, the other one was listed as, as missing in action. I don't know really what happened to him. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, as I say, there were five of us that went into the 351st together, and only two uh, survived at the end. I, uh, when you went into a, a fighter squadron in the 8th Air Force, uh, you became a wingman, and uh, the fighter uh, approach is described as the uh, finger four. I mean, the 8th Air Force fighter groups used flights of four, uh, and uh, the, the flight leader and his wingman were known as the first element, and the, uh, uh, the other wingman for the flight leader was called the element leader and then he had his own wingman so you had a flight of four which uh, in combat uh, split into two elements of two and supposedly you never uh, separated that element you know in other words uh, the, the wingman was responsible for guarding the tail of the element leader whether it was a or the flight leader. And uh, if you were a, uh, a wingman, you were obviously either a, a flight officer or a second lieutenant. And uh, within a fighter group, you actually moved up uh, as people were shot down. In other words, uh, if you were flying a wingman, position in an element and uh, a bunch of element leaders and flight leaders disappeared, you were moved up to become uh, an element leader or a flight leader. And uh, so you became a first lieutenant uh, as, a, as an element leader and then a, a captain as a flight leader. And uh, as you hear about rank in the 8th Air Force, 
fighter groups, this is very important because that's why you had so many uh, very young pilots who became lieutenant colonels and colonels. Uh, if you moved up beyond uh, being a, a captain as a flight leader in a squadron, you could become a, a squadron commander as a major, and uh, uh, the group leader was usually a colonel. And uh, we had colonels who were under 25 years of age. Mm -hmm. you know, they moved up on the attrition that occurred. Um, the, um, the, the German fighter pilots were sent up to shoot down the bombers. They were not sent up to get into aerial combat with the Allied fighters. Of course, the Allied fighters attacked a lot of them, so you ended up with a lot of aerial combat between German and Allied fighters. But uh, they were not set up to shoot down um, the Allied fighters. Their purpose was to shoot down the bombers. And as the war uh, progressed, obviously the Germans, more experienced fighter pilots, uh, got shot down. And uh, one of the big differences between being a, a German fighter pilot and being an Allied fighter pilot was uh, the air war was over Germany for the most part. So many of the German pilots that were shot down uh, we're up again the next day in another plane, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the Germans didn't have 25 tour, 25 mission tours. If you were a fighter pilot in the German Air Force, you just continued to fly as long as you could. And uh, uh, they they flew on the uh, Eastern Front. Uh, against the Allies, but then, or the English and Americans, but then on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the western side, but then on the eastern side, they flew against the Russians. And uh, uh, I was, um, I was looking at your sheet and so forth. I got the Distinguished Flying Cross uh, for one strafing mission where I, uh, was given credit for destroying nine German planes on the ground. Uh, Do you want to tell us about that mission, how that transpired? Sure. Uh, uh, toward the end, uh, they realized that uh, the important thing for the fighter squadrons of the 8th Air Force was to knock out all of the German fighters. Because, um, let, let me back up, I wasn't there at uh, D-Day, which was uh, June 6, 1944, but prior to D-Day, uh, all of the fighter groups were involved in all kinds of strafing uh, so that the Germans wouldn't have uh, anything on the ground that would uh, back up their uh, combat troops on D-Day. I mean, they shot up trains, barges, uh, anything that moved on the ground, trucks, uh, anything that would, could bring supplies to uh, the German troops on the ground. And so before D-Day and after D-Day, there was an awful lot of strafing missions, uh, some of which were uh, linked to flying escort for bombers and then on the way home being released from the escort to go down and strafe. As I say, I wasn't there at that time, but I did have a friend in Rochester who completed a whole tour in three months. Uh, they, he got his 300 hours, 250 hours in in three months, uh, mostly on strafing missions. And of course, uh, after D-Day, the 9th Air Force uh, was established on the ground in France, and uh, their main uh, focus was on supporting the ground troops. And they used the P-47 that I mentioned because the P-47 was a great plane for strafing. It uh, could take a terrible beating and still get back, uh, could get all shot up and so forth. The P-51 was very vulnerable to uh, any kind of strafing hazard. Uh, 
the P-51 had a liquid-cooled engine, and uh, so you had a lot of small lines carrying the uh, liquid uh, coolant. And if you got a just a small bullet hole or flak hole through the through one of these liquid lines, the P-51 would be go down go down in ten minutes. I mean, you'd you'd lose your uh, coolant and the engine would overheat and uh, st stop running. Now on that strafing mission I was lucky because uh, I came back with uh, quite a bit of damage to the P-51 but fortunately none of it had uh, affected my coolant system. And uh, one of the most uh, impressive missions I had was when I was flying uh, as an element leader with uh, our operations officer, Gordon Compton, who is a very experienced pilot and so forth. Anyway, he spotted an ME-262, which was a German jet, uh, down near the ground, and we came down from 10,000 feet, and uh, uh, he managed to shoot down the ME-262. And uh, the ME-262 was, was the, the German jet fighter that they didn't get into production or weren't able to use until right near the end of the war. It was 100 miles an hour faster than the P-51, and if the Germans had had this plane and used it as a fighter much earlier, the air war in Europe could have been quite different. But Hitler got, Hitler interfered with a lot of stuff and one of the things he wanted uh, was the ME-262 was not to be used as a fighter, it was supposed to be uh, used as a different kind of ship, and that put them behind in terms of using it as a fighter. Uh, the, um, the problem with the ME-262 for the Germans was, although this was a very fast airplane, it also had uh, a limited uh, time in the air because of fuel consumption, and most of the ME-262s that were shot down by the Allied fighters were shot down uh, when they were taking off from the field where they were located or when they were trying to get back to the field because they had to slow down. I mean, they, they couldn't fly 100 miles an hour faster than, mm -hmm. than the 55 at that point. Now in our Western, we have a Western New York chapter of the 8th Air Force Historical Society and uh, I didn't get really involved with the veterans organizations until I retired from my full-time job. I was a professor at UP, and then I got interested in the veterans organization uh, after I retired and so forth. Uh, at that point, we had about 90 members. Now we're down to less than 50. Uh, and most of our members are bomber uh, people. Uh, we only had a few fighter pilots, uh, which is understandable because the bombers had ten men on each plane. The fighters only had one. Uh, we had a few. Uh, not all of our members were flyers. Uh, you, uh, I know you interviewed John Hefner yesterday. John was a crew chief uh, in the fourth fighter group. and. Uh, no, I'm sorry, he was in the 357th fighter group, which was the same fighter group that Chuck Yeager mm -hmm. was in. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, he, he was an armorer. Yeah, he was an armorer in the 4th fighter group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or in the 357th fighter group. Now, when the, uh, when the war ended, did your your mission stop, or did you continue to fly like training missions? Or oh yeah, we started flying stuff that would prepare us to go to the Pacific, you know, mm -hmm. including some night formation, which was uh, a horrible thing. Uh, a, in a fighter, flying formation at night is, is horrible because you uh, can't see anything, and uh, it's very difficult to tell where you are most of the time. Uh, in the Air Force, still the Army Air Corps then, 
in order to get your flight pay, you had to fly four hours a month. Mm -hmm. And that's still, I think, the policy in the Air Force. If you're going to qualify for your flight pay, which is 50% uh, more pay than you get if you don't fly, uh, you have to get your flying time in. So we, we always flew at least four hours a month. And uh, uh, we all liked to fly, so that was no deal. I, I didn't fly the P-47 in combat, but uh, they had a P-47 that you could get checked out in after the war ended in Europe, and I got checked out in the P-47. Uh, and uh, I used to, um, I was very interested in photography, so I used to hang around the photo lab. Every, every air base had its own photo lab because uh, each fighter had uh, gun cameras. Mm -hmm. Whenever you fired your guns, this gun camera would take pictures of what you were hitting. And, uh, when you came back, that was the first thing they did was take your gun cam If you were in combat, they'd take your gun camera film out, and it would be set up, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 miles from the air base to where it was uh, processed by this big photographic unit that the 8th Air Force had. And, and the next day, you'd get your fighter film back to document what you thought you'd done and so forth. And uh, every pilot, uh, I think they made about six copies of the combat film. Every pilot got a copy of his own combat film, so I still have that, uh, you know, from World War II. Mm -hmm. What was your uh, favorite plane? And uh, I know you like the P-40, but uh, did you develop a fondness for the P-51? Oh, the P-51 was, a, uh, everybody loved the P-51. I mean, you could do anything in a P-51. You could go to 25,000 feet and, mm -hmm. and so forth. I mean. It, uh, Whereas the P-40 was a good airplane to fly, but it wasn't a good airplane for aerial combat after the early part of the war. Uh, Did the uh, P-51 have any any unusual quirks or characteristics that you had to be wary of, like, like some of the other fighter aircraft? Uh, Flying a fighter was dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of accidents. Uh, we lost pilots who had engine problems, uh, who hit the ground, who hit trees. Uh, I have a book uh, which lists all of the fighter losses of the Eighth Air Force, and uh, it's just amazing what some of these accidents were. I mean, there were mid-air collisions and. Uh, and planes didn't get back across the channel. They ran out of gas and ended up in the water. Uh, the fighters were not all downed by enemy aircraft, you know. There were all kinds of things that went wrong. Uh, Grabreski was a leading ace in the 8th Air Force, and uh, he had completed his, I don't know, second tour, I guess it was, and he was all set to come home. and. Uh, they offered him the opportunity to fly one more mission if he wanted to. They were telling him he had to fly, and uh, he'd been so successful, I guess, he wasn't afraid to fly another mission. And uh, on this mission, uh, they did some strafing, and uh, uh, he made an error in judgment and hit the ground with his propeller. Well, uh, as a result of that, he ended up as a POW for about a year, and uh, he'd just gone home. <laughs> He wouldn't have been a POW for a year. But Gabreski was an amazing uh, fighter pilot because he also stayed in the service and uh, became an ace in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. you know? I think he was a Medal of Honor recipient too, wasn't he? I guess he was. I'm not sure of that. But uh, I don't know, this just may not be appropriate for this, but uh, uh, at that point, Governor Rockefeller. Uh, wanted somebody to head up the Long Island Railroad, and I guess he thought somebody of Polish extraction would be politically wise. He made uh, Gabreski uh, the CEO of the Long Island Railroad, and, and that was an administrative disaster for Gabreski because he really didn't know how to, to administer anything like the Long Island Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, I met Gabreski once, a uh, great pilot. You know, great Air Force pilot. Uh, 
but not a great railroad administrator. <laughs> now, when the war ended, uh, well, let me go back uh, a little bit. Do you, re do you recall uh, your reaction and possibly where you were when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Well, see, Roosevelt died before the war ended. Right. He, he uh, died, what, a couple of months before the war ended. I think he died in April. Well, see, the war, yeah, I flew my last mission in April. It was just a few weeks before. Oh, okay. And uh, everybody was, as far as I can recall, everybody was very depressed by Roosevelt's death because he had been so important mm -hmm. and uh, seemed to be such a great leader, you know. Uh, I remember feeling very depressed uh, by that. And then when the war ended, I was only halfway through a tour. Um, I was glad that the war was over in Europe, but I wasn't elated about the fact that I was going to have to go to the Pacific, you know. Mm -hmm. Because that by that time I had enough experience to know that if I flew another half a tour in, in uh, the Pacific, I might very well not uh, survive, you know. And um, one of the pilots that I went through training with it, uh, uh, and graduated with ended up uh, as a P-51 pilot in Iwo Jima. And uh, uh, years later I had a chance to talk to him and it was a very interesting experience because I knew the P-51s from Iwo Jima flew eight hour missions to Japan, you know. But flying a fighter out of Iwo Jima was quite different than flying one out of England because they, uh, for one thing, just getting to Japan was a navigational problem. They would bring B-17s to Iwo Jima to, uh, so that the fighters could follow them to Japan. Mm -hmm. But then after they bombed, after the mission in Japan, they had to get back to Iwo Jima on their own, you know. And they didn't have the, uh, the radio stations and so forth in England, or rather in, in the 8th Air Force in Germany, I, on a few missions I was not sure where I was and all I had to do was switch to a different radio channel and, uh, and ask for a fix and they were all set in England all the time. In, in seconds they would tell me exactly where I was. You know. So then all I had to do was uh, take the right heading and mm -hmm. go back to England. But this, uh, I was going to comment on this uh, landing and uh, refueling before flying across the channel. I landed in Belgium three times and uh, I was glad I did because I got the fuel that I needed to get back to England. But your combat time, uh, if you flew out on a mission, went all the way to Germany and came back, all the time on that mission counted as combat time. If you landed in Belgium, the time that you needed to get back to England was not counted as part of your combat time. So you didn't want to land in Belgium unless you absolutely had to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose it made sense for the Air Force. They didn't want people landing in Belgium unless they uh, really needed to. They didn't want their pilots staying overnight <laughs> and having a good time someplace on the continent. You know. Uh, I started to say about the photo lab. I, I used to hang around the photo lab and I had a one or two planes in each uh, fighter's uh, squadron had a camera mounted, mounted behind the pilot's head. And I was lucky enough to have one of these in my P-51. Uh, and it would take pictures about this angle. Uh, but you couldn't really aim the camera. You couldn't look through the camera sites. You just had to know that that's about where the camera was pointed, mm -hmm. and it took a big enough picture. So uh, you had to kick the airplane around. You had to do all kinds of things to get it so that your the camera was aimed where you wanted to take some pictures. And uh, I used to enjoy trying to get pictures of, of uh, bombers and, and, and so forth and things on the ground with that camera. And I hung around the photo lab and uh, uh, when the war ended in Europe, whether you went home depended on how many points you had. And the points were based on the number of months that you were in the service, the number of months that you were overseas and so forth. And of course I didn't have that many points, so I was going to have to stay in England. But the guy who ran the photo lab, who was a first lieutenant and who was a, had been trained as a photo 
lab uh, director and so forth. Uh, he called me down one day and he says, how would you like to be a photo officer? I've got enough points, I'm going home. We don't have anybody who has the MOS for a photo officer, but you have the interest and so, you know, you can become the, the head of the photo lab. And uh, I said, great. Uh, so that's what I did. And then after the war ended, I was in charge of the photo lab because the photo lab still had to run. If you had an mm -hmm. accident or anything went wrong on the base, the photo people had to take pictures of it. Uh, and I was smart enough to know that I didn't know how to tell these guys what to do, so I just, on paper, I was the head of the photo lab, but mm -hmm. I didn't really, you know, uh, do much in terms of running the lab. And then later they brought in a captain who'd been with the bomb group, uh, and they made him in charge of the photo lab, but, but he wanted me to stay there because he didn't want to, uh, he'd been doing it for three years, he didn't want to do that anymore, so he uh, started doing projects that he was interested in. He made a rifle and. Uh, and by that time, we were getting colored film. Uh, most of the World War II film was just black and white film, but toward the end of the war, the color film did come in, and there are some eight Air Force things on color. I'm and gonna stop you just for a, a second here. Okay, we're rolling again. Okay. As long as I'm gonna hand you these papers, I guess I'll explain that um, when you went into the aviation cadet program, uh, privates were getting $50 a month in the Army Air Corps. But if you're in the aviation cadet program, you got $75 a month, and that was based on the, the concept of getting a 50% increase in pay for flying. Um, from the time I went in in February of 43 until I got my wings in April of 44, I was an enlisted man. And the, the funny part of this was that um, in order to make you an officer after you got your wings, they had to discharge you as an enlisted man. So I have my enlisted discharge April I don't know what the date is on that. 14th or? Uh, let's see. 15th? April 19, 15 April 1944. Okay, the, the same day they discharged you as an aviation cadet private, they then swore you in as a second lieutenant April 15th, 1944. Okay. Became an officer. Now, um, at the beginning of the aviation cadet project, I guess everybody became a second lieutenant, but then they decided they were going to get too many second lieutenants, so they set up the rank of flight officer, which was uh, comparable to the Army uh, rank of, um, I'm not going to block on that. Like your first lieutenant? No, it's less than a... Oh, like a warrant officer? Warrant officer, yeah. See, it wasn't a commissioned rank. It, mm -hmm. a warrant officer is not a commissioned rank. It's the top of the enlisted rank. So they set up the flight officer thing, and uh, uh, much to the frustration of, of some of the guys who were about to graduate, instead of making those second lieutenants, they made them flight officers. And uh, I guess this fit into the whole business of the, they wanted officers who were uh, top-notch and uh, at the beginning of the war they wanted people who'd been two years in college and so on and so forth, you know, well, they couldn't maintain that so they, they dropped that requirement. But uh, I'm, I'm pointing that out because it's very interesting, most people don't know this. Uh, who was the guy, Schaefer? No. Chuck Yeager? Chuck Yeager when he graduated was made a flight officer. <laughs> he started out as a flight officer. Uh, but then he soon got promoted to uh, uh, the commissioned uh, second lieutenant thing and and, uh, and so forth. I won't go out about Chuck Yeager, but he had a very interesting uh, career in the uh, 357th or 57th fighter group. Um, <clears throat> 
Anyway, I wanted to explain that, because most people don't know about that. Now, once you uh, went back to the States, the war was over, they had dropped the atomic bomb. Did you stay in for a while, or did you get out? Well, see, I was anxious to, to a lot of guys wanted to stay in. Uh, I was not interested in, in full-time military career. I loved the flying, but I wasn't that crazy about, you know, the military uh, part of it. And uh, so when the war ended and they brought us back to the States, I was eligible to get out immediately. So I was discharged in uh, November of 1945. And then I, I wanted to go back to college right away, so I went back the following September to college and finished. But I stayed in the Air Force Reserve, and I was still living in Upper New York, so I went down to uh, uh, Rome, New York. I, what was the name of the field in Rome? Griffiths. Griffiths. I went to Griffiths uh, once a month for my. I still had to get your flight time in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in order to qualify for flight pay. And uh, so I flew in the reserve at Griffiths. And uh, then as I finished my bachelor's degree and got into graduate school, uh, I was just finding it too difficult to keep up with graduate school and run back and forth to Rome and so forth. So I finally uh, resigned from the reserve. But by that time, I had put in two weeks in the reserve one summer at um, Langley Field in Virginia, and I got checked out in the FP-80, the uh, our first uh, jet. Oh. See, in 1948, that was the only jet we had that uh, was ready for combat, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it still was the only jet we had when the Korean War broke out in in '50. But uh, it it didn't last long. The P-80 didn't last long in the Korean War because it wasn't uh, really competitive with the, uh, uh, the, the, jets, the jets that the Koreans had gotten from the Russians, the big, mm -hmm. you know, and then we got the F-86 uh, uh, and so forth. But uh, I was very happy to get checked out in the jet and once I'd done that I thought, well, now I've done it all, I might as well <laughs> hang it up because uh, the P-80 was a, a pleasure to fly. and. Uh, one of the problems with the P-51 and the P-47 and any of the American fighters, uh, they were two-wheeled and tail draggers, was when you were taxing this thing, you couldn't see straight ahead. In other words, you had to S all the time mm -hmm. uh, so that you knew there was nothing in front of you. And uh, when, when you got the, uh, you mentioned the the, the, the P-38, the P-38 had uh, a tricycle type landing gear so you could see straight ahead when you were taxing the P-38. Mm -hmm. And also the F-80, uh, P-80 you could see straight ahead, which was great, you know. There were a lot of accidents in, in, because of the taxing problems. And on one of these uh, fields that I landed in in Belgium, it had uh, the metal uh, link runways, you know, mm -hmm. you, you've seen those. I, I never landed on one until uh, I did it in Belgium because we had paved runways on, on our fighter base in England. And uh, so I landed at this field, which I didn't know very much about, and I taxied around and came in on the perimeter track and, uh, so I could get gas. And I was taxiing along, looking out on both sides and so forth. And all of a sudden, I look out on the left-hand side, and here's a hole about 20 feet deep, twice the size of my airplane. And I was just lucky that I hadn't ended up in this hole, you know. <laughs> they must have been bombed and hadn't gotten around to fix mm -hmm. it, you know. Um, also, the, the P-80 was a different kind of uh, airplane. It was, it was nice to fly. I enjoyed flying it, but uh, with, with a jet, um, you had to be aware of the limitations of the jet. In the P-51, if you were coming in for a landing and you realized you misjudged and you weren't going to be able to uh, 
uh, land this where you wanted to and you might run off the runway at the end or so forth. All you had to do was shove the throttle forward and the plane would climb, you know, I mean, it, it was mm -hmm. instant, instant uh, power. With a jet, it's not the same. If you were landing in a P-80 and you got too low to the ground when you discovered you'd made a mistake and you shoved full throttle, you were going to continue to settle for a while. So you had to judge much faster whether you were going to be able to make the landing you wanted to make in the mm -hmm. P-80. And uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but Richard Bong, who was our leading fighter ace in World War II, um, he was out in the Pacific and he was flying P-38 and so forth. They brought him back to the States. They wanted to keep him alive and, and use him for publicity purposes and so forth. They wanted to make sure he didn't get killed uh, in combat. And uh, he was killed in a flying accident in a P-80 on VJ Day. It didn't get much coverage in the paper because the end of the war was, you know, saturated the paper. And I'm not sure exactly what happened, but uh, obviously it was a, it was just a flying accident on a P-80, mm -hmm. you know, on VJ Day. And Bond got killed. Now. Uh You've got uh, a really nice picture here. Do you want to hold that up and tell us when and where that was taken? Well, this was taken back in back in Lowellville after the war ended when I went home. Before I went back to Hartwick, uh, my parents were still alive. And I had become very good friends with the local photographer in Lowellville. And uh, she and her husband ran this photo shop, and they took this picture. Okay. And uh, all right. It shows how young I was. I I'm very much uh, frustrated with a lot of the interviews and tapes and so forth that they do of World War II veterans because all you see are these old guys, you know, <laughs> and they weren't really the ones that uh, that did the the flying or whatever. Okay. In World War II. And uh, do you want to show us that model and tell us about it? Oh yeah, sure. This was not my airplane. Uh, it's, it's got the painting of a different P-51, but this is what the P-51 looked like. And this was the P-51D, which had the bubble canopy, the famous mm -hmm. bubble canopy, which was uh, so great because you could see, you know, out the back of the plane on both sides, whereas the earlier canopies used to have panels, and you just didn't have that kind of visibility. Now that's the model that you flew? Yeah, that's the P-51D, that's the model I flew. Now did you normally fly the same aircraft every day that you uh, flew? Yeah, that's a good question, but um, you have to realize that when a, a new pilot comes into the squadron, he's going to fly wingman, mm -hmm. and he's going to fly any plane that's available, because he hasn't had a plane assigned to him yet. Uh, after he's been there a while, uh, a plane will become available that and then it'll be his plane, and he'll fly that on every mission if it's uh, if it's okay. I mean, planes had problems and so forth, so a plane might be grounded grounded for a few days uh, just because you had your own plane. Uh, doesn't mean that you always got to fly it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, this doesn't have my squadron uh, insignia on it. This is from a different group and so forth, but. Uh, uh, the plane, the plane in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. has my squadron markings on it. And uh, I knew the pilot that, that flew that plane. Mm -hmm. He just died this past year of cancer. Oh. Yeah. What were your uh, squadron colors or markings? Uh, what did I bring? Let me go to this book here. You said that you were familiar with this. This is the, the Mighty Eighth. Yes. And it's one of the books produced by Roger Freeman, who was the real historian for the Eighth Air Force. And he wasn't an American. He was actually an Englishman. 
and uh, he lived on a farm next to a on a United States Air, Co Air Corps base in England, and he used to watch the planes take off as a teenager every day on missions and so forth. And then he eventually became a historian for the 8th Air Force, and he's produced a whole lot of books, and the 8th Air Force is so lucky to have this man as their historian. Now, he just died this past year. He was oh. 10 years younger than most of the people in the 8th Air Force. But I wanted to show you, uh, in this book, there are pictures of the bombers. These are B-17s, mm -hmm. four-inch bombers. These are B-24s. B-24 had a different tail and so forth, both four-engine bombers. And then uh, we get to the fighters. Now, this group of fighters represents the fighters that were in that particular group. What group was that? That was the 360th or 20th fighter group. See, this group here started out with P-38s, mm -hmm. but ended up flying fighters. So these were the the fighters after that. This one also was a P-38 group. This was a P-47 group originally. They all transitioned to P-51s. The P-38 uh, had the range, but the P-38 had different kinds of problems. Uh, for some reason, the engines in the P-38 had real difficulty with the low temperatures. Uh, I said that Richard Bong was our top ace, he flew the P-38 on the Pacific, but they didn't fly at altitude like we did mm -hmm. in England. And the P-38 just didn't work out. Uh, I'm looking for my group. Here we are. These were the fighters in my group. They started out with P-47s, but by the time I got there, the P-47s were gone, and uh, they were all P-51s. Now the three squadrons in my group, uh, one, one squadron had LH as their identification, LH, and then the, the third letter would vary from individual plane to individual plane, but all the, squad, all the planes in that squadron were LH. My squadron was YJ, so uh, this is what my plane looked like. We had black and yellow uh, checkered noses, and one flight, I'm sorry, in the squadron, in the group, one squadron had yellow tails, one squadron had plain tails, and one squadron had black tails. Now this was very important in the air because you could identify very quickly, you know, mm -hmm. any plane that you saw. Okay, I guess that's enough of that, huh? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think uh, your time in the service changed or affected your life? It amazes me as you look back on that. You know, here I am, I graduated from high school in, in northern New York and uh, had no intention, no idea that I would end up in, in the service. And, uh, uh, Flying in the 8th Air Force was wonderful in the sense that you flew your mission, you came back to a base uh, in England that was safe, the food was good, you slept in a, uh, a Nissan hut. Uh, it was like two different worlds, but you were out on a mission in combat and then you came back to uh, a very residential kind of setting and every couple of weeks I'd get down to London mm -hmm. you know but if you're in the ninth Air Force we talked about Bob Orzel who flew night fighters in the ninth Air Force they were on dirt fields moving all the time to keep up with the troops on the ground and uh, didn't get to go any place really I mean they didn't get to London every couple of weeks or they didn't get to Paris I mean mm -hmm. they were lucky if they just survived and uh, I, I didn't have any of that kind of ordeal, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I wanted to, I thought I wanted to go to medical school, so I was anxious to get back and finish college. And what the colleges did, and I, I know Hartwick was not um, unique in doing this, they, uh, when I went in the service, I went in in February of 44. And I had, as a chemistry major, I was taking uh, organic chemistry and uh, calculus, physics, and they gave me credit for the courses I was taking that semester, which was supposed to be doing me a favor and also uh, enticing me back to Hartwick because nobody else was going to give me credit for those courses. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was not a, a favor. I mean, here I was three years later, I'm trying to uh, act as if I'd accomplished and learned what I was supposed to in those three very difficult courses. So I found it very difficult to finish at Hartwick, uh, but I did finish, and then I decided to go to graduate school at the University of Rochester in biology, and I got my master's degree in biology, and I worked for a few years in this atomic energy project uh, in a research lab at the University of Rochester, but uh, I decided I really wasn't in a field that I wanted to stay in, so in the mid-50s I went to uh, uh, University of Ottawa and got a master's degree in social work. Then I came back to Rochester and worked for Catholic Charities with my MSW and then uh, I had students from the School of Social Work here at UB and uh, after a couple of years the dean here offered me a job on the faculty so mm -hmm. I joined the faculty of the Graduate School of Social Work at UB where I stayed for 32 years and uh, uh, I and my wife moved from Rochester to, to Buffalo and raised our family here. I'll give you a copy of this thing, which is from the, uh, the newsletter of the Graduate School of Social Work at UB. Okay. How many children do you have? I have three. Uh, two, two girls and a boy. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, my son who, after high school, went into the Marines for a tour. And fortunately, he was in during that period when the Vietnam War was over uh, and decided, you know, after a tour in the Marines that he'd get out. So he, he got out and eventually he got a, a degree in nursing. I have a daughter who has a PhD in psych, child psychology who's on the faculty of the medical school and uh, University of Kentucky. Uh, she's not an MD, she's a PhD. Mm -hmm. She's interested in research and, and part of her job is to keep all the MDs doing research. And uh, this was in date there, but anyway, the date's on there. This, this was the thing that was in the, the School of Social Work uh, okay. newsletter. And then this is the uh, quarterly magazine put out by the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And it's really a great uh, uh, magazine. And I've got extra copies of these. Should I send you some? Sure. And uh, they are wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. and the pictures... Uh, the, the, guy, the guy who was uh, uh, the editor of this magazine for years was a, a kid who grew up as an Air Force brat, then became a doctor, uh, and uh, uh, he, he wasn't in combat, but he became very identified with the 8th Air Force, and he just did a great job on this quarterly magazine, which members who pay $30 a year to, to, to belong get four copies a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's one of the best uh, military journals I've seen. A lot of colored pictures and so forth, you know. Okay, yes, we'd definitely be interested in a copy of that. How many I mean, I have, it's a quarterly, see? Oh, and, I see. And because I was president of the local chapter and involved in recruitment and so forth, I could send you several copies. Oh, sure. 
you'd like them. You know? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I answered your last question. I had asked you, um, well, how the uh, time in the service changed or affected your life. That, I think that was the last question. One of the best things that it did for me was provide me a GI Bill that mm -hmm. allowed me to get a uh, bachelor's degree and then a master's degree. Actually, I paid for my MSW and social work myself, but uh, you know, the GI Bill was a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, have you uh, stayed in contact with uh, some of the people you were in the service with? Oh yeah, my group has had reunions and so forth, but we're at the point now where we're probably not going to be able to have one now because traveling is so difficult for 85-year-old people. You mm -hmm. know? The air travel is a mess. It's just, I mean, I went to one reunion. I was on the board of the, of the National and uh, went to national reunions, which was fine, but then uh, I had to go to one reunion down in Where did we have the flood down south? Uh, oh, down in Louisiana. New Orleans. Yeah, I had to go to New Orleans, you know, and, and so forth. And then I got came back to Detroit, and I couldn't get to Buffalo. And uh, you know, when you're younger, this is not a problem. But mm -hmm. at 85 years of age, this air travel, the problems you run into are just too much. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Right. And you are interested in photographs and stuff. See, being, oh, sure. by being a photo officer, I got an awful lot of photographs and stuff, you know. And uh, I don't think they're useful to you unless they're labeled properly. Right, you know? right. So it'll take me time to get some stuff together for you, but I will do that. Okay, we'd appreciate that. Yeah. We have a very large uh, veterans research library in the museum, yeah. and we have uh, literally thousands of photographs but I know we don't have that many photos uh, from the 8th Air Force. We have individual photos from some of the... What about your, your circulating library? Do you have a, a library that circulates books? Um, I'm not sure how that works because I have nothing to do with the, the library per se. I know that uh, uh, for research purposes, um, well, they have... They do participate in the interlibrary loan system where if they need a book, somebody comes in for research, they'll get the book for them or else... Um, well, see, what I'd like to know is if I could get you any fighter group histories. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they, they've got a few of them that have been donated by individuals, but uh, I, I know there's only a few of them, not very many. See, and I, if I... If I donated one, I would want it to stay there for research purposes. Oh, yes. Not to it, circulate. Say. Oh, no, it, they're, they're normally not circulated. Um, well, I might make a real effort to try and get you some fighter group history. Okay. You know? I, I know the uh, librarian would uh, definitely appreciate that. Should I call and talk to the librarian? Uh, you can do that. And, uh, I mean... Got, I've got your number. Yeah, I don't have his phone number. But uh, I can give you the uh, phone number to the um, main office, and they can transfer your call down to the librarian. Why don't you write it on the back okay. there for me? Or if it is not there already. Okay, yep, I can do that. All right, and uh, again, thank you for your interview. Well, thank you for doing this. I think it's great that you're going around the state and doing it. I know that the downstate chapter of the 8th Air Force Historical Society has had some contact. You say the, the museum's been in existence nine years? At its location uh, now, it's been in existence. Basically, uh, we were a storage facility for the state's uh, military collection. Uh, we bounced around from the state capitol to, to uh, one or two of the armories. Then we were uh, based out of the Waterville Arsenal down in Waterville. And now the uh, <clears throat> The museum in Saratoga is the permanent home for the state's military collection. And is it going to stay there? Yes. Yes, it's a 19th century National Guard armory oh, yeah. that has been converted to, the, to a museum. Right. As I say, have you had any contact with the downstate chapter? 
No, we haven't. I can also give you a, a printout from the 8th Air Force Historical Society stuff. See, being president of the, of the chapter and so forth, I got stuff over the years of, of uh, all of the members in New York State, which uh, I'm sure you're not going to contact all these members, but this will be a, a very useful kind of reference mm -hmm. uh, thing to check in names, you know. Okay. I'll, I'll see what I can put together. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you.